In part one, we discussed how the factory LS2 intake manifold is likely the worst flowing LS intake manifold ever made. And we also discussed how the fast LSXR102 intake manifold is quite possibly the best cathedral port intake manifold ever made. We also discussed how much power I'm hoping my mostly stock LS2 powered C6 will gain. and three different ways I intend to verify the post installation results. Finally, we went through the removal process of the stock LS2 intake manifold step by step. So if you missed that video, be sure to watch that one first. There's a link to it in your upper right hand corner and then come back to watch this one. With that out of the way, thanks for coming back for part two. We're gonna backtrack just a couple of steps so that this video can essentially start with the first steps of the installation of the fast LSXR 102 manifold. Boys, boys, boys. Immediately after you remove the stock LS2 intake manifold, go ahead and vacuum up all of the crud that's been hiding underneath with a vacuum cleaner and then clog each of the individual intake ports with a cloth so you don't drop any dirt or anything else like a nut down into your cylinders. Now go ahead and scrape, clean, and brush all of that more stubborn grit from all of the surfaces with the vacuum running to minimize the chance of any dirt from getting in to your engine. Now let's take a quick look at the fast LSXR manifold and compare it briefly against the stock LS2 manifold. The manifold comes boxed in such a way that damage to the manifold during shipping is minimized. Kudos to Fast for doing this. The manifold is very good looking and I must say I'm a sucker for the fancy LSXR102 logo, which is kind of silly, but if we're being honest. And it also looks to be carb approved, which I'm pretty sure means the California folks can even use one of these. Comparing the two manifolds side by side, the fast manifold is wider, taller, and I think even a bit longer, so I can only assume the fast engineers made it larger in the search for airflow. If you look inside the stock manifold, you are greeted by what I think are three pillars in the middle of the manifold, which I can only imagine restrict flow and or create turbulence. Inside the fast with the larger 102 millimeter opening, I see the pillars have been removed. Turn the manifold on its side and the ports are materially wider as you can see by my simple large nut demonstration. The stock manifold won't let the nut in and the fast manifold lets the nut fully inside with room to spare. Same thing holds true for the runner length with the fast coming in a little bit taller. Oh, and as we'll see in a minute, the floor on the fast intake is lower as well. So much so that the valley cover bolts will need to be replaced with much thinner ones so they don't press into the floor of the manifold. Now it's time for my least favorite part. You have to remove the valley cover bolts and do this one at a time and replace them with the provided special thin Allen head bolts to allow for extra clearance for the manifold. Maybe my 5mm Allen head socket is worn out, but when torquing them down to step, I managed to strip out two of the heads. I remedied the situation by modifying two of the stock bolts with a grinder, making their heads thinner, and they both threaded in and torqued to spec without issue. Next, remove the four bolts holding the fuel rail to the intake manifold and carefully pry up on the rail to dislodge all eight injectors from the intake manifold. Then go ahead and clean all of the injectors with a clean cloth and solvent and set it carefully out of the way. The first step with the new intake manifold is to remove the shell from the rest of the manifold by removing the three bolts at the rear and the two bolts at the front of the manifold. Then at least for my LS2 C6, I got to drill a hole in the front of the manifold so that the map sensor is able to sense manifold pressure. Once that's completed, the MAP sensor seal is lubed with silicone grease and the sensor is installed. Time to put the cover back on and the instructions call for a thin film of RTV on the seal located in the rear corner of the manifold before doing so, and so we'll carefully take care of that. Then the cover is placed back on, making sure everything is lined up properly 
and the five bolts that we just removed are given a dab of Loctite and then torqued to spec. Next we have these three little rubber isolators that get installed on the bottom of the manifold. To make sure they stick, be sure to clean the attachment points of the manifold with solvent and then press them in place. Now it's time to install the fuel rail that you cleaned earlier. First give each injector o-ring an inspection to make sure they're in good shape. Then give each of them a little engine oil to make sure they slide in without any damage or deformation to the o-ring. With the injector tips all lubed up, line up all of the injectors in the holes and gently push them in. Then using the four new bolts supplied in the kit, apply a dab of blue Loctite and torque them down to spec. The passenger side rear manifold has a small vacuum port that we don't need to use, so to make a plug I use a short piece of vacuum line and a bolt with some RTV on it. Then it just slides fairly tightly onto that port and that's all we need to do. Also it helps avoid trips to the auto parts store if you accumulate over time various vacuum lines, connectors, and fittings for occasions like this. Next we move on to installing the EVAP port. I'm not sure why this one's not built in, but after lubing the o-ring it just takes two screws to tighten it into place. I read a couple of posts online where a few people complained about the build quality of the manifold, so I checked all of the intake ports with my finger and I only found a couple of minor ridges, nothing major, but since I do have the proper tools I decided to flatten them down. Now we can install the intake port seals. These do cost extra from fast but they do fit snugly into the manifold so they won't fall out when you're installing it and you definitely don't want to skimp in this area. Now we're getting close to installing the manifold so I'm giving the cylinder heads and valley cover one last cleaning with solvent to make sure everything is as clean as possible. Before setting the new manifold into place, be sure to connect the brake booster hose to the manifold with the bends in the correct orientation beforehand as there is little to no space to do this once the manifold is bolted to the engine. Also the two rear manifold bolts cannot be installed once the manifold is fully located in place. So use a piece of rubber hose split lengthways, slid over the two bolts to hold them from sliding all the way down. Now if you can, grab an assistant when setting the manifold onto the car and your life will be much easier. Have the assistant route the brake booster hose behind the oil pressure sending unit and through the correct path so that the hose ends up at the vacuum booster where it'll need to be reconnected. When getting the manifold to its proper location, you and your assistant will also be moving hoses and fuel injector harness wires, etc. carefully out of the way as the manifold is being lowered and slid carefully back under the cowl and onto the engine. Once that is done with a good light, take a few minutes to make sure absolutely nothing whatsoever is caught underneath the intake manifold. Now you can carefully proceed with torquing the 10 manifold bolts down following the process and sequence shown in the instructions. I was not able to get my 3 8 inch drive torque wrench with 5 millimeter allen head under the cowl for the back two bolts, so I used this setup instead and used my professional judgment to get the back two bolts close to spec while using the torque wrench for all others. I did however tighten the rear bolts as per the sequence shown in the instructions. Next go ahead and install all of the connectors to the fuel injectors and the main harness connectors to the fuel rails on both sides. Now we can install the throttle body seal and then using the four bolts provided in the kit, give each one a dab of blue Loctite and torque them down to spec, then go ahead and reinstall the air intake system. I don't have any footage of it but I was not able to get my stock vacuum line from the valley cover to the manifold to fit. So I used a short piece of 3 8 inch vacuum line bent in the shape of a U instead. It does take a little bit of work because the manifold port seems to be a smidge larger than the port on the valley cover. Also when connecting the harness plug to the MAP sensor, the MAP sensor definitely sits a bit further away than it did before, so be prepared to remove a little bit of the tape from the harness so you can isolate the MAP sensor wires, which should give you a little bit more length, allowing the connector to reach the MAP sensor. Now we are getting close, so while your battery is still disconnected, go ahead and fish the alternator cable over the top of the engine to the back of the alternator and tighten its nut to spec. And while you're there, reconnect the EVAP hose to the front driver's side port on the manifold. 
Finally, go ahead and connect the fuel line to the fuel rail. Then you can reconnect your battery cable and then cycle the ignition once and carefully check for fuel leaks. If you don't have any leaks, go ahead and start the car and listen for anything that sounds like a vacuum leak and make sure that there's no check engine lights that come on. If the check engine light does come on, it most likely means you forgot to connect something. Well, fortunately for me, I didn't have any leaks or check engine lights, so the installation is now complete. In the comments from part one of this video, there were a couple of questions that I think a lot of other people might be wondering as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and answer those now. Question number one, why didn't I opt for the ported version of this intake from Mammo Motorsports? Well, first, I think it's unclear, and actually I doubt that my relatively stock LS2 engine would see much, if any, additional gain by going with the ported fast intake over just your basic out-of-the-box fast intake. And second, Tony Mamo of Mamo Motorsports is very good at what he does, and as such, his services are in high demand, and therefore he gets a pretty good premium for the ported version of the intake, which costs about $600 more than the out-of-the-box version. Question number two, why didn't I go with the larger 102 millimeter throttle body over the factory LS2 90 millimeter throttle body? And the reason is through the years, everything I've seen and read indicates that it really doesn't offer any performance gain. And that's further demonstrated by this recent video by Custom Works Performance. As you can see, they literally are, are identical. 492.7, 493.8, 530, 528 horsepower. And I mean, it's, I mean, this is identical. And now it's finally time for the fun part, tuning, testing, and evaluating in an effort to objectively determine whether or not the LS2 has picked up any additional horsepower or not. I've actually already made several test drives with the C6, and as you might be able to see from the cable running up the side of the car, I've got the wideband oxygen sensor all hooked up and connected. And as you can see, there's a number on the windshield because I just got back from Rock Falls last evening where I spent the day all day testing and tuning. So now I have a whole bunch of observations and hard data to work with. And in part three, I will be conducting an objective analysis to hopefully make sense of it all and provide you with my conclusions about the efficacy of a fast LSXR 102 intake manifold on a relatively stock LS2 engine. I hope you enjoyed the video, guys. They are a ton of work. And if you did, please do me a favor and tap that thumbs up below. Subscribe so you don't miss part three. And most of all, thanks for watching.